we're going to see this technology continue to develop and continue to put pressure on the legacy financial system because I don't think they can compete. When you actually understand what this technology is delivering, why would you keep your money in a bank when you can keep your money in your hands and you can get incredible rates of return in the crypto economy versus your bank account. I mean, you can use something like a more centralized service like BlockFi and you get like 8.6% of your dollars, or you can use something like Compound Finance, which is more decentralized and you get great rates on your dollars over there as well. Or you can have it in like a Chase bank account and get 0.01%. It's just, <laughs> it's not even fair. It's it's laughable, exactly. It's not even fair how, how much decentralized finance is going to disrupt multiple industries. people are buying and holding Bitcoin. 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 Let's take a look at Bitcoin. Some call this digital gold. Everybody should probably have 1% of their assets in Bitcoin. Dear crypto community blockchain buddies across the globe, welcome back to Kryptonites, the no BS blockchain channel built with the community and for the community. And today we have another mind blowing guest, Lark Davis, aka the Crypto Lark, here to share his best practices on how to find the best coins and tokens, but also Bitcoin versus altcoins, but also his favorite crypto assets. And then we're going to move on to Ethereum and Ethereum 2.0 and tons of fascinating topics. So don't forget to stick until the very end and put your comments below so that we can start debating and learning from each other. So without a further ado, a big thank you and hello to you, Crypto Lark. Lark Davis, how you doing today, buddy? Pleasure to be on. Excited to have a chance to chat with you. Yeah, definitely. It's been a long time and you've come a long way, my friend, creating awesome content on YouTube, becoming a global educator, and of course, rocking those awesome shirts. So first and foremost, the first question that I really want to ask you, Lark, is related to Bitcoin dominance and Bitcoin versus altcoins, because there was a very strong sentiment among Bitcoin maxis earlier this year but recently, some of these maxis are testing out altcoins and maybe putting 90% in Bitcoin, 10% in altcoins. What do you think is the future of Bitcoin dominance? Will it go up? Will it go down? Let us know your views. Yeah, absolutely. Bitcoin dominance uh, has been falling. Uh, it's been falling steadily for a couple of months now, basically since Bitcoin has flatlined, um, which has been happening since a little bit before the Bitcoin halving. The price of Bitcoin not moving has meant that altcoins are now able to finally breathe again. And we've seen just massive moves in the altcoin market. And the more that altcoins gain, the more Bitcoin dominance falls. Now, a lot of people are under the false perception that a falling Bitcoin dominance is somehow bad for Bitcoin, but that's absolutely not true. We have to remember that Bitcoin hit its all-time high at the height of an altcoin season. So a falling Bitcoin dominance is actually good for Bitcoin because it means that the entire crypto economy is seeing a lot of activity. And if we know one of Bitcoin's main use cases right now, well, outside of just hodling your Bitcoin, is actually trading Bitcoin. And what do people trade Bitcoin for? We've seen derivatives volumes falling down. So people aren't trading Bitcoin for Bitcoin as much people are trading Bitcoin for altcoins. And when they get those altcoin gains, they cash it back out of the Bitcoin. It becomes this virtuous cycle of people speculating, making money, trading, investing, all this stuff. So um, I see Bitcoin dominance falling farther unless, unless, of course, this is all caveated on if there is another massive financial crash in the equity markets. I think that'll just send fear again through the crypto markets and people rush back into either Bitcoin or into cash and altcoins could be left for speculating in a future time. But right now, if we kind of continue the way we've been continuing, I think Bitcoin dominance will continue to fall and altcoins will continue to make massive, massive gains. 
absolutely right, Lark. That's such a good observation because when Bitcoin dominance was at its lowest, the price was at its highest. And speaking of which, you know, in terms of market maturity, you know, last year, whenever Bitcoin would dump, just like a mothership bringing and sinking all its baby boats, you know, it would have a huge impact on the market. But this year, we're seeing something slightly different. You know, even when Bitcoin goes down, some altcoins are going up. So what does this tell you in terms of market maturity, Lark? I think we're finally starting to see a lot more, uh, as you said, maturity come into the altcoin market. If we even want to call it the altcoin market anymore, I just like to refer to it as the rest of the crypto economy. But um, we're seeing companies that are building really, really good products. And that's just a fundamental difference between now and 2016, 2017, when we had the start of the last bull run, moving into the last bull run. We basically had very, very few working products. And now look at what we have. We've got the survivors who have come out of the bear market. They've come out swinging stronger than ever. We've got some fantastic products delivered, great decentralized exchanges, great decentralized finance products, and um, lots of great wallets and some more fiat on-ramps than we've ever had before. It just keeps getting better. So that's, I think, a big difference there. That makes a lot of sense. And I love how you use the word crypto ecosystem and not just altcoins, because for those watching out there, altcoin is an abbreviation for alternative to Bitcoin, which are most of the Bitcoin forks, such as Litecoin, Zcash, Monero, Bitcoin Cash. But the ecosystem is a lot more sophisticated with utility tokens, security tokens. And speaking of security tokens, Lark, in 2017, we had the ICO hype. But in 2018, we had the security token or STO hype. And on one of your shows, I remember it was the, it was called the death of ICOs, the birth of STOs. But we also see that security tokens were a bit overhyped even then. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on security tokens. Is there still a future for this? The security tokens market is a really interesting one because what we had with ICOs was zero barriers to access. If you could launch a smart contract on Ethereum, you could raise money, you could launch something, right? Maybe not. You still raise money anyway, but... Uh, the IEO boom, which came after, which was the initial exchange offering, that um, was a bit of a flash in the pan. We had people, oh, where are we supposed to be excited about new projects again? And so people threw a lot of money at stuff, and some of those were good. Um, we saw Binance obviously leading in that regard. They launched a few good ones. Um, other exchanges came in, and it was actually interesting to look at the uh, return on investment of Binance IEOs versus everyone else. And basically only Binance okay. IEOs made money. Every other exchange launching IEOs was just like, Minus 99%. So there was that to keep in mind. And so then security tokens came in. And security tokens are, are fundamentally different because what do security tokens require? They require regulators to get off their butts and actually do something to help regulate these securities, right? And so that, I think, has been the key problem for a lot of security token providers is that regulation is not catching up to the technology. Now, we do have some more forward-thinking jurisdictions. We do have some countries that are, tr I think, trying more to make um, security tokens become a reality, places like um, you know Switzerland and uh, Liechtenstein and uh, a few other uh, jurisdictions that are working to try and make that happen. But it's tough because what we're talking about is the actual merger of securities laws with decentralized technology. And so the technology largely is ready. We've seen a lot of security tokens actually being launched. The problem is that regulators are still not really catching up and are kind of making it difficult. So I still do believe that security tokens are going to be an incredibly, incredibly important, important part of the crypto ecosystem. It just depends on when those get all the regulatory approval that they need and enough key jurisdictions to make them into a flourishing ecosystem. You're absolutely right, Lark. We need to remove all those regulatory restrictions and make security tokens a global phenomenon once and for all. And of course, I need to ask you a question related to your awesome course, Wealth Mastery. You this year, my friend, have been calling the craziest bull runs for all coins and tokens, literally mooning. So I'd love to ask you, what is your dirty little secret, Lark, when it comes to choosing your favorite coins and tokens? fundamentals, technicals, pumpamentals, tokenomics, what is it? Please let us know. There's quite a few different criteria, and it, 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 sometimes some will have more points than other points, let's say. But uh, in general, you have to look, is this actually going to be something useful? Is it going to provide utility uh, in some form, right? Um, and we've seen with kind of your classic 
utility token, a lot of utility tokens didn't actually end up providing very much utility to anyone. So they, it's why we saw utility tokens in particular get absolutely slaughtered, and many of them are still at incredible lows. Um, some utility tokens have managed to actually deliver utility for their product. Um, we could look at um, for example, like the Binance coin, that's actually started off as a utility token, right? And it's obviously morphed into something else, um, launching their own chain and stuff like that. But that's an example of how a utility token can be successful. Now, when you're looking for a, a crypto that's got all the right factors to pump, right? That's a tricky one. But one of, some of the things that I usually look for are what are they actually trying to accomplish? Um, that's a big one, right? Is it is it a niche that the market's ready for? Because there's some great ideas out there that I've seen that I look at it's like, we're just not ready for that. Maybe, and maybe I'm wrong. I'm wrong often, right? It's not about being right all the time. It's about, you know, cutting your losses and pushing your, pushing your winners and all that stuff, you know, wh when you get the chance. But I look and I think, okay, is it going to do something useful that's going to get adopted in the crypto market in... in the relative near future, because that that's important. Because if you don't have hype behind a coin, if people don't look at it and see, oh, that's going to be good, right? Then you have a problem. Because if you, no matter how good your technology is, if you have no hype behind it, if you have no community behind it, it's not just about hyping stuff in the short term. I'm talking about building hype long term. Again, Binance, right? They continue to build hype because they continue to deliver new products. They continue to innovate and lead the pack. And so. That's one thing that you really, really need is that that community base of people who get excited about what you're doing. And we've seen some cryptocurrencies do that very, very well. Another one to look for is who's actually backing the project. You know, you look at, um, you mentioned too, Kava and Reserve. And so in both of those situations, I mean, Kava's backed by uh, XRP. It's backed by Cosmos, right? They've got big investments. They've got big backers. And that's important because that means that they've got connections that are going to help them be successful in actually delivering on their vision. Again, with RSR, uh, that's another similar one where they're backed by Peter Thiel and Valar Ventures and, you know, the founder of YouTube and all, all, the, all these big names are backing them and have invested in them. So, you know, again, when you see that kind of backing, you think, okay, these guys are going to have the connections as well as the resources to make this successful. And because these venture firms and these investors, they do tend to coalesce around big projects, you always have to wonder when you see a company that hasn't managed to get catch really any investor interest in that, in that way and say, well, what are they doing wrong? Why aren't investors lining up at the door to get a piece of this, right? So that's something to consider as well. Uh, obviously, tokenomics is a big, big, big one. And this goes a little bit back to the utility uh, token conversation, but why sh should I go out and hold your token? What is the actual incentive to go and buy this token? And for a lot of cryptocurrencies, it's a pretty hard answer because they may say, well, it's a, a governance token. You're going to have a right to go. I don't, I don't want to govern your platform. You govern your platform, right? Maybe some people are interested in that, but really what people want, they want to make money. That's the primary reason for investing. It's nice to have some right over a, of a platform, but what people really want is money. Uh, and that's, we've seen a lot of token models being changed over the last six months. Mm -hmm. So I think a great example is uh, Kyber, right? Look at, they've changed their token model to where it's now a deflationary dividend paying token. And it's be proven to be incredibly popular, incredibly popular mm -hmm. with investors. So if that's one of the big things. What what do you, What's in it for an investor? And that's when you're looking at a token, that's what you need to ask yourself. Because if you just have, you know, some minor utility, then utility can be useful. If you get 50% off on your fees on an exchange that you like using, like Binance, it can be a very useful utility. But it's got to be a useful utility. It's got to give something for investors, big backers, and great token economics. Those are kind of the keys of finding a good crypto. So... Boy, that was so well put. So guys, you heard it. It's not just about having great utilities, but great tokenomics on top of that to really find the valuable coins and tokens and not just speculate. And speaking of speculation, Lark, what is your overall view on partnership, 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 partnership that are not necessarily connected to the coin and the token? Is there a little bit of overhype in partnerships these days? Yeah, it's, it's very problematic. We do see um, a lot of companies using the names of bigger brands in sometimes completely fraudulent way, often just in a, a disingenuous way, because they're, you know you might not really be a partner with Amazon, you're just using Amazon web services like anybody else could, right? And so <laughs> yeah. that's, it's uh, great, good on if you're using Amazon web services, but you're not really partnered. And sometimes 
those partnerships, they are real partnerships, but I think they get overhyped in terms of, well, what's that partnership actually mean, right? Okay, maybe they're running a node. Well, that's great, but is that going to drive the price up to the moon just because a big company is running a node for your decentralized service? But nevertheless, it is good to see when we do have these real partnerships um, where we do have companies that are actually partnered up with you know, a big company like Google or Amazon or Siemens or whatever it might be, and they're actually doing something with that technology because it says that, well, this technology is actually interesting and useful and enterprises do see a reason to be using this. But do, as an investor, stay frosty out there. I've seen so many people that will put... Um, you know, throw a Coinbase logo up on their website or something like this, and you're not actually partnered with the Coinbase. Coinbase isn't even invested in your product. You're just using their wallet or something like that. And that's, <laughs> you know, that's disingenuous. It's disingenuous as an investor. Yeah. You have to watch out for that kind of stuff. So it's, it's hard to spot sometimes because as an investor, you know, you see this stuff and you just, you want to trust that what you see presented is going to be legitimate, but it's not always the case. So... Really well put. And you know, a lot of my friends tell me that the partnerships are important because the company may use the token eventually. But if that's the case, then we're purely speculating, right? There's no real use case. And a lot of them also say, no, but you know, Alex, it's kind of like buying a share in a company. And I tell them, no, it isn't. Shares represent global rights across the company, while coins and tokens are very specific to a certain use case. So I said, no, that's not the case. You really need to make sure that there is a connection to the token. So thank you so much for clarifying that. But moving on to crypto portfolio diversification, a lot of people have allocated some of their portfolio in Bitcoin. That's the easiest way to start. And then, you know, explore with maybe some protocol tokens like Ethereum. But it's very difficult to, number one, understand one's risk appetite, but also number two, how to diversify your portfolio, you know, based on large cap, you know, small cap, micro cap, nano cap taking risk, et cetera, et cetera. So I would love to know from you, Lark, how are you creating your portfolio and what are you allocating specifically to maybe the higher risk assets and the lower cap in that sense? So please educate us on that. When I look at the market, I, I look to look and see what the, what's actually going on in the market, right? What are the current trends? And I rebalance my portfolio based on that. Now I've basically got around half of my, well, yeah, about half my portfolio in Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, sometimes I will take more of those assets and deploy them for, for trading purposes or for short-term uh, speculation in different uh, cryptos. But um, for the most part, uh, around half of my crypto portfolio is in you know the more blue chip uh, cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, in terms of my risk appetite, um, I think there's a pretty high risk appetite personally because there is an incredible opportunity for investors during a trend like we're currently seeing to make big returns. And you have got to be willing to take risks in order to do that. Now, I'm not saying go out and put 100% of your stack on some micro cap uh, cryptocurrency, because even though it's only a $3 million market cap, you think, okay, great, this is going to go to 300 million, we make all this money. It can also <laughs> go down to 300,000, and you can lose all your money. So it's well worth keeping in mind that even when making riskier plays that you should still be practicing good risk management techniques that includes deciding when to cut losers because you are going to have losers look at venture capital firms venture capital firms they invest in a lot of stuff and that's another thing if you see a venture capital firm invested in a cryptocurrency it doesn't necessarily mean that's going to be successful they invest in a lot of stuff and they assume that many of these are going to lose and they're going to sell them at a 50 60 70 80 percent loss they're looking for the two or three they're going to do 10x 20x yeah. 30x or 100x and so that as an investor is very important to understand that sometimes it just isn't going to work out that you do need to cut those losers and cutting losers is fine it's normal it's healthy right because even if you invest in something today in six months time the picture could look very different they may not have delivered the partners may be dropping ship or whatever it is you can adjust your opinion and cutting a loser is an important uh, part of that aspect also keeping your position size relatively low as i mentioned around half my portfolio is in um you know bitcoin and ethereum but that doesn't mean the other 50 percent is in like you know super like micro caps and stuff like this actually a lot of it is in um bigger stuff like kyber which i see as much more of a you know solid long-term kind of thing or synthetics which i see as a solid long-term kind of thing and my actual amount in the really small cap uh highly speculative stuff is maybe around 10 to 15 percent of my portfolio which is a little higher than it is 
uh, usually, to be honest, because it is more, more of an altcoin trend right now. But even then, any individual investment, it's maybe 2% of my portfolio. And I can give you this as a good example. Um, Elrond was one that really exploded recently. And um, when I entered it, I think it was like 3% approximately of my portfolio. Uh, now it's moved up significantly. So you know, I'll need to rebalance that at some point when I take profits. But the initial risk was quite low. So even if I'd lost all that money, well, I've only lost 3% of my portfolio. If I lose 50% of that investment, I've only lost 1.5% of my portfolio versus putting in 10 or 20% of my total investment. So those risk management strategies still do come into play even when making those risky investments. In fact, that's probably the best time to be using them. So something for everyone to keep in mind out there. Awesome, Lark. You know, I love how you gave all those examples, specific percentages, you know, because at the end of the day, I feel like one of the biggest flaws in terms of the maturity of the market is lacking of understanding our real risk appetite, right? And some people just putting in too much stake into specific high risk assets and, and having a really bad time. So it's really important to understand that. And thank you so much for sharing that. It was very, very useful. Yeah, it's, it's important yeah. for investors to do that. I mean, if you haven't had that risk appetite conversation with yourself, have it now because it's an important one. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely. Awesome. Uh, there's another question I wanted to ask related to DeFi. So you're talking about DeFi and, um, you know, there are a lot of big trends happening uh, this year. And I just wanted to, for you to tell us a little bit more about where you see DeFi going as of today. Obviously, Compound came in the game. Uh, we have also Aave, which is the number one performing coin and token year to date. Uh, what is your overall view on DeFi? I know you're very passionate about this, Lark. I see you, you know, really pushing this decentralized finance message through your videos. If you don't mind sharing a few points on that. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. I mean, decentralized finance is, is massive in its application. And we see a lot of um, companies rebranding to talk more about DeFi now. But um, the, the, the DeFi players that have been around for a while... Um, they're incredibly powerful when you realize the technology of them. I mean, I've been watching Uniswap closely recently. Uniswap doesn't have a token um, at the moment. Maybe they will release one at some point in the future, but there's no Uniswap token. But um, Uniswap is very, very interesting because what you see happening with them is that they've their volume has absolutely exploded. I saw yesterday they're up to like uh, $45 million a day in volume or something like that, which for reference oh, wow. is like um, about one-eighth of uh, Coinbase. So you can understand how big their volume is becoming on a decentralized platform. We also see people doing initial liquidity offerings, which is kind of similar to a, an, an ICO offering where they'll be listing their tokens there and then investors can come in and play around and grab tokens and speculate and all that stuff. And this is all happening in a decentralized manner. You can also be a liquidity provider. So you can actually, if you have spare tokens sitting in your wallet, you can make money by being a market maker in a totally decentralized way. So what I see happening with these decentralized finance services is a complete reimagining of the way that we understand finance because what you have globally right now is a system where you have a lot of walled gardens, right? And if you live in a walled garden, that's a good one, a nice garden, right? Then you're lucky and you can have access to a rich, rich uh range of financial services. If you don't live in one of the nicer walled gardens, then you're basically screwed. Whereas with decentralized technologies, now we have the ability to offer anybody anywhere who has access to a smartphone, a savings account, right? You can get a savings account and lend your uh, dollars out on compound finance or something like that and get a decent annual rate of return which is very, very powerful. You can also take a decentralized loan. So if you do have that collateral sitting there, then you can go and get a loan for that and do it all in a decentralized way. And those loan mechanisms with projects like Maker, which is definitely, you know, for all the hype that's going on around some of the, the players that have, um, you know, seen bigger gains and, you know, maybe newer to the scene, Maker, one of the older projects, they're still incredibly powerful. And they've started integrating real world assets so you can now take a freight invoice or you can take a music royalty futures and um, actually exchange that for cash on the Maker platform, which it's very, very powerful stuff. And this is just the early applications for this. So we're going to see this technology continue to develop and continue to really put pressure on the legacy financial system because I don't think they can compete. When you actually understand what this technology is delivering, why would you keep your money in a bank? when you can keep your money in your hands and you can get incredible rates of return in the crypto economy, 
versus your bank account. I mean, you can use something like a more centralized service like BlockFi and you get like what, 8.6% of your dollars, or you can use something like Compound Finance, which is more decentralized and you get great rates on your dollars over there as well. Or you can have it in like a Chase bank account and get 0.01%. It's just, <laughs> it's not even fair. It's it's laughable, exactly. It's not even fair how, how much decentralized finance is going to disrupt multiple industries. Multiple industries are going to be disrupted by this. And it's primarily going to be the financial industries to, at the start. We will see other use cases come in later on, but decentralized finance, it's it's big. It's um, if you have the money to be able to participate in um, yield farming or in liquidity making, then there's a lot of money to be made there too, especially early on. You know, a lot of these things that are going on, these platforms of successful people like Compound Finance and Ave, if they're successful, they're going to be here for a long time. They're going to be the big players in 10 years time and getting their tokens now that could be very, very profitable in the long run. So Lark, now I really need you to educate us and educate specifically my grandma, Susie. How would you explain yield farming to the general public? Obviously it's a really hot topic these days. So go ahead, please let us know what this means. Basically using your assets to make more assets. So if you have money or a non-money asset, money is the most popular. So we see people using uh, dollars. That's probably one of the most popular ways to uh, yield farm. But if you also have other assets, you can do that. So if you have uh, another asset like Ethereum or basic attention token, you can use those assets to produce yield. So getting yourself those returns and by providing that um, liquidity, you also get a bonus on top of that of an extra asset. So you take your money to make more money, basically, is what yield farming is. It's just it's um, you can use different assets than straight money to do that. So you get tokens yeah. that are you know access to platforms, you know, like rewards points, essentially, for uh, using it. So you can put your money up, you get some rewards points back, and enjoy. This is why we're such a great educator, Lark. And moving on to Ethereum and its transition to Ethereum 2.0 and possible kryptonite, we know that Ethereum in terms of price action has been doing really well, but fundamentally, there are some serious concerns such as the congested networks, crazy gas fees, which makes it very difficult to use adapts, plus the upcoming of third generation blockchains such as Cardano with the launch of Shelly, its mainnet, is this a big concern of yours or is it just healthy competition? How confident are you in Ethereum's future? I think the longer that we see ETH 2.0 being delayed, the more market share they're going to lose in terms of competitors. Because right now what we're seeing, and not many people are talking about this right now, but I think this could be one of the next big trends is actually DeFi on other chains. And it's mm -hmm. it's starting to happen right now. Not many people are paying attention to it, but there's a lot of projects that are starting to launch on other chains that are addressing the decentralized finance market. I mean, um, if you're a fan of Tron or not, Tron has just launched four decentralized finance protocols on Tron. They're all named after Justin, which is ridiculous, but that's a, it's a different topic, I suppose. But um. <laughs> Tron's getting into it. Uh, WAN Chain's got a couple of decentralized finance uh, projects. A lot of people had counted WAN Chain out. WAN Chain's back from the dead, and they're launching some DeFi stuff. Um, uh, Polkadot's announced some DeFi stuff. Cardano, obviously, is looking at DeFi as well. So this is going to happen. And the longer it takes ETH 2.0 to actually roll out, the more these other players are going to start to gain market share. Now, there's a lot of things that are still working in Ethereum's favor, massive network effect, all the developers, the exchange access, the wallet access. I mean, they're still a thousand miles ahead of the nearest competitor right now. And with layer two scaling solutions, it actually makes it easier today for some of these products to scale. I mean, we have um, Matcha, which is a decentralized exchange, which has just launched. And they're um, using a layer two scaling solution. So the on exchange fees are nothing. You're not actually paying any on exchange fees. So that's a big, big difference when you look at, um, you know, using some of the more uh, gas intensive smart contract applications. And that's not going to be fixed necessarily by a layer two application. That's just about the asset transfers. But when using these smart contracts, you are going to be paying a lot of gas fees. Look, Ether, Ethereum, it's got, it's got a lot of work to do. It's tough to change the tires on a car that's going 100 miles an hour down the motorway. And that's exactly what they're trying to do right now and the engine. So it's it's not easy. 
but that's the the task at hand for Ethereum, and um, I believe they are going to pull it off. They've got more developers, more backing, more money than anyone else. The question is when they're going to pull it off, because even when ETH 2.0 Phase 0 launches, which might not even be this year now, it might be early 2021, could get pushed back even farther. That's just phase zero. That's just phase zero. Mm -hmm. Whereas we have competitors who are coming up who are fully operational today. They have everything today. They've got the sharding. They've got the high high transfer speeds. They've got low low cost transfers. They've got good security models, et cetera, et cetera. And they're hungry for position. And we see that um, happening. We see the rise of Cardano. Um, and that's uh, we're also seeing others too v chains had a, a big run recently and we see how many people are working with them we see how much is built on these chains so yeah the long-term success of ethereum it's nothing's definitive we're still so early in the crypto economy but I, i'm a big ethereum fan i'm a big ethereum holder i think ethereum is doing fantastic things and i do believe that they will deliver the technology the question is when and in what state will when. we be by that point Nice analogy with a car running at a thousand miles an hour and changing the wheels and all that kind of stuff. Very, very cool. Now, Lark, I need to ask you a question related to Wealth Mastery. It's a course that seems really, really interesting. Can you share a few insights about it and, and what you're working on these days? Yeah, so Wealth Mastery is basically, uh, it's a newsletter that comes out once a week. And the idea of Wealth Mastery is to really give people the cutting edge in their investing. And so with that, it's looking at market moving events that are coming up. Um, so, for example, one example would be a Bancor. For example, uh, Bancor V2 is coming out really soon. So that's likely to be a market moving event for Bancor as we get closer to that. We've seen historically that these events can have a lot of impact on price. So we're looking at that kind of stuff. We're looking at technical analysis of Bitcoin and different cryptocurrencies. We have a, an AMA every week with an industry leader getting the insights on their project as well as you know their general insights on the industry we're doing research reports every week on trending cryptocurrencies so that you as an investor can know okay what is this cryptocurrency should i run out and buy it and uh, it's great actually my the the guy jesse who's doing the the research reports he's um he's very much a, a bitcoiner and so he, all of his um and he's been around for ages so he's he's um takes a very healthy skeptical view when looking at a lot of these reviews and i think that's really good for investors because so often when you see these research reports in a lot of places it's just people who are writing them because they're potentially paid um or just invested or they have ulterior motives and it's not necessarily an unbiased review of that crypto so we're trying to give just no fluff no bs information that investors can use every single week to help them grow their wealth in the long term so that's that's the idea. That's really cool. I, I'm so glad that you hired someone with a skeptical eye. Those are always the friends that I love to share ideas with the most because you know they're gonna cut the chase, right? They're gonna give it to you straight and honest. <laughs> that's that's important. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go, guys. The crypto lark. We talked about Bitcoin, we talked about altcoins, dominance, how to find undervalued assets, how to diversify your portfolio, E2.0, and many other timeless topics. So don't forget to like, subscribe, and blast that bell notification and join us again next Wednesday, 8 o'clock BST, premiering at a PC near you. Thank you so much, guys. <laughs>